Peter, can you tell us something about your own uh, personal background? Yes, well, I'm, I'm not actually from England at all. We're, we're living here, but I was born in New Zealand mm -hmm. uh, back in 1958 into a, a Christian family. My father was a congregational lay minister, but he was a businessman and a teacher mm -hmm. and a scientist uh -huh. uh, with most of his time. Mm -hmm. And my, my mother was from a Christian background as well. I had one brother, we're, so we were brought up in a Christian family for which we really thank the Lord. Mm -hmm. And as I say, my father was a very active lay member of the Congregational Church. So he was yeah. the president of the Congregational Church. He used to preach, it seemed, most Sundays. And I'd wake up in the morning on a Sunday to him preparing a sermon at the dining room table okay. that he did on top of all his work. So I, I grew up thinking that was normal. We went to a uh, a multi-denominational Christian church, Bible-believing church. Mm -hmm. And I really came to faith, I think, primarily through my parents and then through the youth group and uh, youth camps and so on. And then uh, went to, uh, graduated from school, went to university to study medicine along with my best friend mm -hmm. and um, specialized after that in general surgery. We had a very active Christian medical fellowship group at Auckland University Medical School. And people were very mission-minded. We had a lot of uh, missionaries dropping in, speaking to us at conferences or at, at, um, at meetings we, we held. And we were really brought up with the idea that you don't, uh, you, you go unless you're called to stay. Mm. <clears throat> and because that's where the need is, because in New Zealand, everything was uh, you know, so, so well catered for really. Mm. So I, I, got, um, I got married. I married my best friend's sister at the end of medical school. We were a year apart. We did our uh, house jobs and she specialized in pediatrics and I specialized in general surgery. Mm. And then in the late 80s with two small children, we were very much set mm. on working in the developing world as uh, we thought career missionaries, we thought the Lord was calling us into. And so we uh, had enrolled and got into All Nations Christian College, which was a missionary college in the UK, okay. planning to go there for a couple of years. And we were advised to go and work in the developing world before that so that we knew what the questions were when we arrived. So we went to Kenya with the Africa Inland Mission and worked in a, a mission hospital called Kapsawa in the West Kenyan Highlands for about a year, then on, on to All Nations, where... We joined 170 students from 40 countries around the world. Uh, almost all were pursuing either trades or professions. So there were doctors, nurses, lawyers, pilots, engineers, motor mechanics, um, all training for cross-cultural mission work abroad. And, and that those two years were really life-changing for us. It was the 89 to 91 period. So during that time the berlin wall came down the whole of the, the maps of the whole of eurasia were being rewritten closed countries became open countries and we were there with a whole lot of other young people aged between 25 and 35 who were really fired up about world mission and so we thought that we were going back to africa that was very much our plan mm. and uh, god of course has other ideas and to cut a long story short he called me out of clinical medicine altogether. I, I really wrestled during those three years mm. with, uh, with leaving various things that were very dear to me. When we left New Zealand, of course, we, you know, we left our, our home and family and friends and church and culture and country and all of that and stepped off the, um, the professional career ladder to go to Africa. Many people thought we were crazy, but, but uh, in, once we got to the UK, I realized that, that God was calling me to lay aside my clinical medicine, to, to stay in, uh, uh, to give up my dream of being a missionary doctor in Africa, which is what we lived for for the last few years. And, and most difficult at all, of all, and uh, Ernest will probably understand this better than most people, to agree to live in England uh, <laughs> permanently. 
And I found, actually, I found the cultural shift as a New Zealander going into England was much more difficult for me than going to Africa, where it was, I felt much more at home in East Africa. So I stepped out of, we had our third child at that stage, I stepped out of clinical medicine mm. to take up a role with the Christian Medical Fellowship in the UK, so the, the uh, equivalent of EMFI, uh, and I went into the role of full-time head of student ministries there, serving a thousand student members and uh, 5,000 doctor members throughout the UK and Ireland. And I did that for nine years. And then when the CEO left, I, I was asked to become the CEO. Mm -hmm. So I stepped up to that role at the end of 99. And then I did that for 19 years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in, at the end of 2018, uh, the Lord called me out of that to take the baton from Vinod Shah as the chief executive of the ICMDA, the International Christian Medical and Dental Association which uh, I think, as a lot of you will know, brings together over 80 national associations of Christian doctors and dentists around the world. And I'd been on the board of that uh, movement for about 15 years or so. So I, I knew pretty much what went on. I knew a lot of the people. And in many ways, it was uh, a logical step for me. So I'm in my early 60s now. Um, and I've been in this role with ICMDA now for, for two years. Uh, just over two years altogether. So we have three grown-up children, two married, and we've got uh, just two grandchildren at the moment. And I live in the leafy green suburb of St Albans, which is just north of London. And uh, it's <coughs> historically of interest because it's the home of the first British martyr. Alban was a Roman who lived in a town here and was converted yeah. by a priest who was fleeing from persecution back at the beginning of the third century. And uh, he refused to recant. And so he lost his head over that when the son of the Roman emperor was visiting and called for a full trial. And he became the first Christian martyr in Britain, oh. in this very town where we live now. So um, when we were at All Nations, one of the lecturers there, who some of you may know, Martin Goldsmith, he's written a lot of books on missiology and was a uh, missionary out in Indonesia for a while. And, and he, when I got the job with CMF, he said, if I had that job, I'd live in St. Albans. And I said, well, why is that? He said, well, it's the center of the UK for travel. Uh, because if you think about rail and road and air links and so on, it, it's actually the center of the UK for international travel as well, because we're just a short jump from Luton, Heathrow and Gatwick airports. And so uh, having lived in about 10 different country, uh, 10 different houses in, in uh, th five different cities in three different countries in our first 10 years of marriage, uh, since that time, when we came to St. Albans, we've been in the same house here now for 28 years <laughs> altogether. And uh, this year is our 39th wedding anniversary. So my wife, Kirstie's just retired. She's been a community pediatrician and so that's how we got here. So we're, we're Kiwis living uh, <laughs> cross-culturally in Britain, <laughs> but almost now half our lives have been spent in this country. So there's a, a quick Cook's tour. But I, I look, as I say, I look back to my, my parents primarily as, as those who led us to, to faith. And my <clears throat> brother, um, who was a teacher, married a doctor, married the the one of five medical daughters of the professor of medicine at, at Auckland University and went into a teaching career. And then he was called out of that and uh, led the, the tertiary students Christian fellowship for, for 10 years in, in New Zealand. Um, so if you're familiar with IFES, the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students, TSCF is the New Zealand branch of that, like, like UESI in, in India. So it was rather odd how each of us got called out of our careers into uh, a more full-time Christian ministry role uh, within a few months of each other, right at the beginning of the 1990s, and without really having a conversation with each other because we're on opposite sides of the world. But uh, Peter, uh, Peter, did you, ways. Peter, did you yeah. uh, did you have a personal encounter with Jesus, or did you gr just grow into into it? It's a fascinating question because 
I I can never remember a time when I didn't believe that God exist, yeah. existed, that he was a real and personal, that he listened and answered prayer. Mm. And right from the very earliest stage, you know, we were brought up to believe and to pray. But of course, during my my uh, development um, as as uh, you know, a teenager and then going into medical school and so on, I would say I had probably half a dozen real encounters where I was, you know, called uh, deeper into an understanding of what it really meant. And of course, as when I understand, understood who Jesus was, what he had done for me, mm. and uh, what he was, you know, calling us to, and what his purposes were, it uh, really became the defining direction of our lives. So I, I can't, I'm one of these people who can't say it happened to me on this at this time, at this date, in this particular place, I can tell you about various encounters. But uh, it it was I was brought up in a Christian home and drawn in that way primarily to, to Christ. Uh, Peter, will you please tell us something about your core ministry? You know, something that drives you. <clears throat> when I when I first went to uh, CMF, mm. there'd been several. Uh, strands really. I, I mean, I was deeply committed to medicine and uh, surgery and, and could see uh, the needs abroad and how um, what a useful thing it could be and, and the way that uh, Jesus sent his disciples out to, to teach and to heal. I was also very interested in evangelism and apologetics. Uh, got particularly interested in that at medical school and trying to reach colleagues for Christ and getting involved in lots of conversations and, and to some extent uh, struggling and growing in my own faith and in, in finding the answers to the difficult questions. Yeah. And I was also very interested in medical ethics. And uh, when we were junior doctors, my wife and I got very much involved in pro-life advocacy and mm. In, in an attempt to try and change the New Zealand Medical Association's policy on abortion. It's because once you put your head over the parapet on things like that, you, you get drawn in more and more. And so when I came to CMF, it, it seemed to bring together everything that, that really God had been doing with me and leading me in from the evangelism and apologetics to healthcare mission to the, the surgery, obviously and uh, ethics and so on. And I ended up in a role as head of student ministries that involved teaching and leading and mentoring in all those areas. And then when I took over as chief executive, then there was probably a lot more advocacy. I, I was involved um, from the time I became chief executive of CMF from about 2000 through to 2018, in a lot of advocacy, particularly on pro-life issues. Um, so a lot of uh, work in Parliament with MPs and peers, a lot of media work and debates, writing, that kind of thing. So uh, stopping the legalization of euthanasia and assisted suicide mm. became a major passion during that period of time. And by God's grace, those of us working together were able to, to see no change in the law over 30 years of advocacy there. Mm. And then uh, with moving to ICMDA, mm. I, I think behind everything, what took us to Kenya, what took us to all nations, what took me to CMF initially, the attraction was this, this, the international nature of the student ministry because mm. God opened our eyes up to seeing how, the, how London in particular and the cities of uh, Europe in general were like little Antiochs or Jerusalems mm. where in the first century where God had brought people from every country under the sun and uh, they all spoke English and they were accessible mm. and uh, at, at a time in their lives when they were asking questions. So what initially took me into student ministry was, was seeing the potential uh, with English being the language of the internet, the language of medicine, the language of science, and London being in many ways a centre, that mm. it was like uh, it was a great place to do cross-cultural mission and that God was bringing people from all over. So actually, when I was doing the student ministry, 
I got very much involved in um, evangelism uh, and apologetics amongst Muslim people because there were lots of Muslims in the medical schools in Britain and the Muslim groups were often outnumbering the Christian groups, the Christian unions, uh, you know, in, in size and in uh, motivation as well. So there are a lot of opportunities to to uh, to train and to do evangelism amongst Muslims in in Britain, where uh, you don't get taken off to prison for having a conversation, but um, but you can you know you can build friendships and make good conversations. So I, I think that those were those were some of the things. But when I um, when I took the job in CMF, remember the the um, we just joined the Christian Medical Fellowship in Britain, and we were were wondering where God wanted us to go next. And there was a hospital in West Africa. This is back in 1991. Hospital in West Africa in Niger, which wanted us. And there was a medical school in Ethiopia who were very interested in me coming out and doing surgical teaching. And then there seemed to be delays over both of these things that we couldn't really understand. Letters were not responded to. Time was drifting on. My wife was saying, you know, where are we going to go after all nations? And, um, you know, can you tell me at least with our third child coming, which continent we might be on in three months time? And I honestly didn't know. And I remember saying to my tutor at that time that I felt like I was swinging across a deep chasm on a vine that was going to break. And I didn't know if there was anything on the other side. And I didn't know if I could get back to where I jumped from. And and I had my whole family with me. And he said, well, you know, God's been faithful to you thus far. You've just got to trust him. And it was actually after that that the whole thing opened up and I was called out of clinical medicine to uh, work with, with CMF. <laughs> so it was a, it was a great time um, to be there. And, and as I say, when the advert came through the door and my wife looked at it, Kirsty looked at it and she said, this is it. I said, what do you mean? She said, this is what you've been prepared for all these years. I, I said, what do you mean? We're going back to Africa. No, she's, no, she said, look, you've got to read this. This is, this is it. And, uh, and I, I read this advert. My first thought was, uh, but I can't do this because I'm, I'm a surgeon and we're going back to Africa to do surgery. And anyway, I went in to explore it with the then general secretary, Andrew Ferguson. And it was really during that three hour period that we were sat down and talked that the Lord opened my eyes up to see that this was actually quite a strategic thing to do and that I had been quite well prepared for it over the previous time. So I always say God's God's word is a light to our path, but not to our horizon. And that we we may we know where we're going in eternity, but we might not know what the next steps are. And so we have to be yeah. um, you know so we have to be open to what he might have for us and he might lead us in directions that we that are beyond our wildest imaginings and that we'd never thought of. And so we need to be very adaptable and open to <clears> that and learn to hold the future lightly. And I think that was one of the lessons that we, we had to Peter, learn when we were at Four Nations. Peter, what was the impact uh, of your ministry among the students? Um, well, it's very difficult to measure, measure something like that. Well, I think, I think if I look back at my time at CMF, yeah. um, I think, I mean, it was a time when the fellowship grew a lot in, in numbers and activities and, and so on. But, but I think if I, if I look back, the thing that, was, that is most important is to, is to see in the relationships and the friendships that you form, particularly with students, to see how they grow and remember what they were like in the early 1990s and what they've grown into now and in finding the path that God has prepared for them, you know, and the good works that he's made for them every, every day. Um, and to think, well, uh, by God's grace, you had some part in being an encouragement or a guide or, you know, a, a, a leader along that, that way. So I, I think that's probably the, the thing that's been one of my greatest motivations is seeing people change. Peter, one of my one of my concerns um, was something that bothered me that even faith-based hospitals like CMC Valora Ludhiana 
Uh, I was a student of Velour and a director of CMC Louisiana. There was nothing, not a single day de designated for mission, uh, how to do missions or how to do apologetics, you know, and we were all being prepared for mission to be missionary doctors. That was a great efficiency in our training program, at least in these uh, faith-based hospitals. What do you think? <clears throat> about well, I think, I think medicine is a wonderful gift and a wonderful career. Mm. Um, I have no regrets at all in being a doctor and training as a surgeon, and I love being a surgeon. I think, I think <clears throat> that like any good thing, medicine can become an idol. Mm. And I think it, it, if it becomes the most important thing, in our lives mm -hmm. so that we hold on to it too tightly rather than seeing it as a gift of God to be used in his service. <clears throat> but, but I think also the other thing about medicine is it can be all consuming mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, take one's entire energy. And maybe this is one of the things I learned from my father that, that he was, you know, a successful teacher and then a businessman, but he was, very much convinced about every member ministry. I think that was about his congregational roots, but, but every member of the church, every member of Christ's body is uh, a minister mm -hmm. who has gifts that can be used to build up the body of Christ. And so he, he always took that very seriously. So he was always incredibly involved in the church and in preaching and Christian ministry and chaplaincy and, and so on as well and he did that alongside his his work uh, but i think there's another element that that some that um we we have to see or understand that that christ is the lord of every single aspect of our lives and he's just as interested in what we do in the hospital and how we do it as he is in you know what we do in in the church so that we avoid this kind of secular sacred divide, but rather seek his lordship in and uh, his excellence in everything that we do, whether it's as, as uh, children, fathers, mothers, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, church members, community members, doctors, uh, in everything that we do. It's, it's part of the things that we do as unto, and as unto him. Yeah. The reason why I'm asking you this question is because there are many mission hospital doctors or even in the secular uh, places where they want to do evangelism but don't know how to because they never had this training in apologetics or in uh, mission, uh, how to do it. There's, do you think there is room for this kind of training while, while they're still students, both uh, graduate as well as postgraduate? Oh, absolutely. And I think it needs to start when people are young and students and uh, it was a major plank of our ministry at CMF that we trained people in evangelism and apologetics. So um, we, we had a course which we're still using actually in ICMDA called Confident Christianity, where mm. people learnt about uh, how to share the gospel message in their own language, how to cross cultures with it, mm. how to understand where people were coming from and to lead them from the truth they knew to the truth they didn't mm. and how to answer the questions that came up for seekers along the way and to be confident and being able to to do that i think it's an incredibly important skill i think for me personally i i learned those things at medical school through trying to reach my uh you know fellow classmates who were not believers mm. and and seeking to so they'd ask questions and, and you had to uh, be able to give a good answer uh, to them. And, and I initially didn't know a lot of the answers, so that I, I did a lot of reading when I was at medical school. I think I read about 20 C.S. Lewis books over two, two years in my fourth and fifth year. And, and much of it was about being able to answer the questions that people, people had. So I, I brought that passion along to, mm. to CMF. And I think similarly, when, um, when we saw the Muslim groups in medical school, not to be intimidated by them, but instead to 
engage them, to go along to their meetings, to put on debates with them, to get in dialogue and discussion, and to be able to answer the specific questions that they brought up. So I think it's incredibly important. We're, we're all told, aren't we, to give an answer for the hope that we have within us, but with, to do it with gentleness and respect. Yeah. And, and I, I think it, we can take our medicine very seriously, um, but, but if we are you know, children in the sense of being able to explain our faith and defend it, then that's a, a great tragedy, I think. Uh -huh. So yes, yeah, so I think it's incredibly important. We have, as I say, we've got the Confident Christianity program. We have another program called Saline Solution that we, we do in partnership with other organizations along with CMF and ICMDA, mm. which is about learning, um, learning ways of, of uh, indicating your Christian faith and then uh, seeing opportunities to share faith within the, within the consultation, you know, provided that one can do it with sensitivity and permission and, and respect. But I think it's it's very important that there, there of course some of us are evangelists with a big E, you know, where where we have the gift of evangelism if you like, but we're all all called to be evangelists with a little E to be able to explain the gospel and to uh, defend it. Mm. I think uh, Peter, uh, what do you think you know you have a global perspective on what's going around around the world. What has been the impact of uh, COVID on uh, uh, health-related concerns, uh, economics, and so on? Well, huge. I, I think for me personally, my first year at ICMDA, I did 20 trips to 20 different countries around the world. Mm -hmm. And then uh, since March of last year, I've been sitting at this dining room table where I am, looking out on our back garden. <laughs> and I, I had, uh, there were 10 trips and conferences that were canceled between uh, you know, when, when COVID hit. And of course, none of us were expecting it. Mm. And we had to think, how are we going to adapt to this new situation? And uh, CMF, or at least ICMDA, the whole life of ICMDA is around um, resourcing Field workers, we've got about 54 now from 42 countries. They're all doctors and dentists and full or part-time medicine who do their uh, uh, ministry work on top of that. Uh, so our, our work was about resourcing those people to travel and make connections and uh, build up and mentor and train leaders. And then the other part was around events, particularly conferences, not just national, but international, regional and so on. And, and all of a sudden, all of that stopped just like that. So, so what were we going to do? And, and of course, there was nothing to do at, at first. So we had to, as they say, pivot and adapt. And so we thought, well, what's changed? Well, the Great Commission's not changed. Uh, the Lordship of Christ has not changed. He's still coming back. He's still sovereign. He's still on the throne. He's still working his purposes out. So he must be wanting us to do things in a different way. And we thought as ICMDA, our vision, which is a Christian witness through doctors and dentists in every community and in every nation, that had not changed. And our aim of starting and strengthening national fellowships had not changed, but the way we did it was changing dramatically. So, so essentially we switched to an IT ministry. And so we already had a very good website. We had good uh, connections. Uh, through social media, we, we had people in 14 countries around the world, seven language groups. And so those connections just became a lot stronger. And we, we switched to online events, online prayer meetings, online conferences and so on. But at, uh, at Central Office, the first thing we did was to start a, a blog so that people could write. Uh, and then we started a webinar series in April last year. And Firstly, we began focusing on uh, topics around COVID. So all of the initial talks were around, you know, public health and COVID, general surgery and COVID, um, general medicine, working in a mission hospital and COVID, and all, all of these sort of things. And then 
we've kept that going now for, for over a year. So a year later, we've done 60 global webinars. We get between 100 and 400 people at each one. Mm. We, we can choose really good speakers. Our attendees usually come from between 40 and 60 countries mm -hmm. uh, every time. And it's, it's been amazing the way it's brought everyone together. We record everything, put it up on our YouTube channel, and the webinars have had over 30,000 views all, all together. So that's been a, a good initiative. Then starting online training programs. Um, in uh, We've got a program in bioethics. We've got one in evangelism, one in Christian leadership one on healthcare mission, another one in developing volunteer ministries. And so the way these work, they're all, they're all uh, international. Uh, we work with small groups of about eight to 10 people. They apply to do these courses. And then you do say leadership training over 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. And so if, every week you, you have a video to watch, something to read, you interact, on the, on the Slack um, uh, platform uh, with other participants in the course answering questions. And then you come together at the end of the week for an hour to an hour and a half of small group work and discussion. And so we found those groups have really uh, built good uh, cross-cultural links, created friendships in this new environment. And then people have been taught and then they've become facilitators of the same programs going forward. So after they've done the 10-week the program, they then become a facilitator for others using the same material. Um, we put together a, a database of 1,500 church and mission hospitals throughout Africa and, and Asia, mm -hmm. initially to help with COVID training, but it's got other purposes uh, as well. And then we, we launched in March last year in conjunction with CMC Valor, Mm. Uh, and Loma Linda University in California. We, learned, we launched a two-year distance learning diploma in family medicine, a blended course mm. uh, where the teaching is all done online. We just had our first cohort finish their first year, 28 of them, and 50 have started uh, in the new cohort in May this year. So we've now got almost 80 students from over 20 countries who are training in family medicine. And we hope this program is going to grow as well. So we look back and think, how do we ever have any time to, to travel or run conferences? And uh, what are we going to do going into the future? So it, it's had a huge impact on, on ICMDA and the way it runs, but of course, um, a, a huge impact, of course, on the members of all our national organizations. So ICMDA has, over 80 national movements. Amongst them, there'd be probably around 60,000 doctors and dentists all together. And uh, all of them, of course, have been hugely impacted by, um, by COVID in the way they're, they're practicing and what they've had to, to deal with. And it's um, led people to think very much about, you know, how it's going to shape mission in the future. We all know about the effects of lockdown on hunger and famine of people being pushed into poverty, the disruption of immunization rollout, mental health problems, family breakdown, domestic abuse and so on. And then of course, all the, all the crucial medicine for the cancers and the chronic diseases, high blood pressure, diabetes, um, HIV, all, all these things have been a huge challenge that, that COVID is, has uh, created. And then, of course, we're not we're not emerged from it yet. Every every country is in a different situation, yeah. and where it's great to see the vaccination programs being rolled out, but but we we can't see things returning to normal certainly any time in the next few months. Yeah. But I think it's it's also asked big questions of missions and of doctors and dentists, uh, you know, of or people in any profession about how their life is going to be different in the future as a result of COVID and particularly what the impact on mission is going to be mm. in the future and the way mission is done. But as I say, that the Lord's not changed, the Great Commission's not changed. Um, it's just that we have to do it in a different way. And, and honestly, when I look back over the last two years, it's, it's quite hard in terms of the ministry of ICMDA, it's quite hard to think 
of anything negative that COVID has brought. I would say mostly God has used it to, yeah. to, um, to, to force us into developing new ways of doing things that we would never have thought of mm. uh, before. But having taken them up, uh, I think you're going to be an integral part of what we do going forward. Here in India, we see a lot of the churches have closed down. And as a result, the house church movement has really uh, got a huge fillip. You know, you know uh, people, uh, everybody's reporting that people are coming here to be prayed for. Yeah. Or, or people, uh, churches are going out of the way to help people. And that's bringing forth fruit. One, the biggest church in India, Calvary Church in Hyderabad, which seats 50,000 people. Wow. wow. <laughs> they converted that into, they only had permission for 50 members. So they converted that into a COVID hospital, 500 bedded COVID hospital. <laughs> and uh, free treatment, free food, free oxygen. <laughs> uh, so this, uh, this 50,000 uh, 50, seat uh, church converted into COVID hospital, 500 bedded hospital, free food, free accommodation, free medicine, free oxygen and so on. And that has brought a huge uh, crop of harvest of uh, souls because, you know, uh, this is now the holistic church. We are taking care of body, mind, and spirit. And uh, this, is, this, this, is, this, this is now a, a true church, a holistic church. <laughs> and uh, so many churches have gone out of the way to help these starving people, uh, who lost a job or, or sickness yeah. or all kinds of things that have happened. My question is, uh, you know, uh, technology <laughs> is going to play, uh, is playing very important part and is going to play even more important part. Uh, but evangelism is well developed in, in technology, but discipling, uh, many people think that it, discipling is relational, it's a process, it's not an event, unlike evangelism, which is an event. Uh, it's a process. Do, what do you think about, um, we don't have discipling tools, do we? Or it must be scarce. Uh, uh, digital discipling tools I'm talking about. Uh, we have to develop that. Uh, evangelism, yes, there's plenty of that. But uh, we should be encouraging people to develop those tools to disciple. And then to the point that they become disciple makers. Yes, well, we there's a partner organization to uh, ICMDA called HCFI, Healthcare Christian Fellowship International. Mm -hmm. And uh, the leaders of all these movements are very good friends and the the current president of HCFI, Chris Stein, who's a, a Dutch GP, very good friend of mine, and he's developed a disciple-making uh, ministry course that we're using with ICMDA. And it started off with, with seven uh, sessions on on what he calls the greats. So there was the great commission, the great commandment, the great prayer, the great guideline, and, and so on, all of which were developed from the teachings of, of Jesus. So there are passages and things for people to read. And then he's gradually developed this now so that he's up, he's got 40 sessions all together that people can do. And it works in a small group so that you, you gather together with no more than four or five others, um, for about an hour and a half or so, you spend some time in prayer, you look at the material, discuss it, you, you talk about the challenges you're facing, you make commitments for, for what you're going to, to do in the various parts of your life before you meet again, and you come back and, and share and pray for one another. And then uh, as those groups grow and develop and they go through, then they split up and everyone in the group uh, takes up a new uh, group, asks others to do it. So th that's... Um, one program we're using, but as I say, the online training that we're doing is really discipleship. If, if discipleship means knowing the Lordship of Christ in every area of our lives, then we need training in all these areas. So as I say, we do bioethics, healthcare mission, leadership, baptism and apologetics, all on the same basis, bringing people together from uh, different countries, different language groups to learn and study together and I, I think there's a huge amount that can be done online um, of course there are there are things you can't do but but uh, there are great opportunities that we would never have imagined had yeah. we not been put in this situation right. by COVID. Um, 
what are your future plans um, strategies that you are going to be thinking of implementing well we with ICMDA we're just in the middle of our board meetings at the moment we've got we've had subcommittees for the last couple of weeks and we've got our main board meeting next week and then at the end of the year we'll be putting together our plan and budget for the next few years and we have a whole series of of different strategies but i i think that the heart of icmda as i say the vision is a christian witness through doctors and dentists in every community and every nation our aim is to start and to strengthen national movements mm. but actually if you ask me what that boils down to it's very very simple it boils down to the training and development of leaders and particularly young leaders okay. and so our our strategy is all around uh identifying training mentoring and developing mm -hmm. young leaders and we believe if we focus upon that then the future of national groups will be assured and we'll we'll continue to grow into other countries so we there are what 194 countries in the world so we have we have a map uh 84 of them are green which means we have a national association affiliated with us 30 30 of them are, are, are orange which means there's a national movement we're aware of which we're working towards affiliation to and then there are the blue countries where we have individual contacts but no national movement and then the gray countries where we have nothing so we have and we divide the world into 14 regions. So we have a, a plan for each of those places and each of our regions has a regional secretary who heads up the work in that region and a, a team who work with him along with the national leaders. So we're, we're, we're quite intentional in the way that we're going about it in our small corner of the vineyard, if you like. Uh, and, and we think that, that doctors and dentists uh, have in, in some ways a, a unique role in that they can cross cultural boundaries and that medicine and dentistry are great tickets for getting into uh, places where you can't simply go as a, as a pastor or a church planter or a Bible teacher, particularly in restricted access countries. And so, um, you know, ministry in the workplace through living a life of obedience to Christ and being a witness in that situation we think is is very much the future the the, the world is not going to be reached by full-time pastors or full-time missionaries it's going to be reached by every member of the body of christ growing into maturity and being salt and light where they where they are and of course discipleship is absolutely key to that and of course the great commission is not it's, uh, it's not about evangelism primarily. It starts with evangelism. It starts with baptizing people into God's kingdom. But uh, discipleship is a lifelong process which involves um, you know, every member of the body of Christ helping every other to be able to grow into full maturity yeah. and the things that God <clears throat> yeah. has for them. And I think if, if we... You know, we can have big goals and visions, but actually if we if we focus just on that, as, as we're trying to do at ICMDA, focusing on the the uh, development and training of leaders, mm. then we believe everything else will follow yeah. naturally on from that. And of course, that was the Lord's strategy, wasn't it? He just devoted himself to 12 and within that to three, in the best of three years. And that was his strategy to reach the world and now 20 centuries later we can see the um the end of that yeah. vision being realizable and the gospel growing in, in extraordinarily in all sorts of places where there was no christian presence just a few years ago so that to me is what's most exciting about icmda is just seeing what god is doing in every country of the world and how he's raising up yeah. workers for for the great harvest field ushering in his return there's still a lot of work to do but um i'm immensely encouraged about it and feel greatly privileged to be involved uh, in the way that i am peter here uh, you know as distinct from evangelism which is making converts uh we we pivot off from john 15 8 where he says and this is how 
God is glorified that you bring abundant fruit and then you shall be my disciples. So we connect discipleship very much with fruitfulness. Yeah. So we say, okay, you are now a disciple because you become fruitful um, branch. So fruitfulness is uh, very much uh, our <laughs> emphasis on discipleship. Uh, <clears throat> I want to ask you, uh, this pandemic, uh, how, where does it fit into the end time scenario? <laughs> <laughs> well, my father used to say, son, there are three things you need to know about the return of Jesus. Okay. Number one, mm. it will happen. Number two, no one knows when. Number three, therefore, you should always be ready. And the, the way to be ready is by being in God's grace, being faithful where he's placed you. So I, I think I, I have a book. I have a book in the, the room actually just behind me called The History of the World. Yeah. And, um, and I, I haven't read it. I've read the last page because I want to know how it was all going to end, you see. And, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> although I already knew. <laughs> but uh, it was very interesting. It said on at the on the last page, it said, so what do we learn from all of this? Mm. You know, a thousand pages of world history. Two things. Firstly, things can happen much, much more quickly than you'd ever imagine. And two, things can happen much, much more slowly than you'd ever imagine. <laughs> and, and I think I was really brought up to live an expectation of the Lord's return within my lifetime, you know. Um, and we, but of course, we don't know when the Lord is going to return. We look at the, the sorts of signs he, he talks about in the Olivet Discourse and, you know, in Mark 13, Luke 21, Matthew 24, and so on. And, and we can see all of these things happening but we know all these things are meant to mark the last days from the time of his first coming to the time of his return but we we see the gospel penetrating to the edge ends of the world and, and we see um you know matthew 24 14 and then the and then the end will come you know so we see god's purposes being worked out but i don't think we know is it going to be our lifetime our children's lifetime or whatever but what we do know with great certainty, when we think, see things like a COVID pandemic, it should alert ourselves to our real priorities. And, and uh, that if this is not the last generation, this is certainly the last chance for this generation. And so every generation should be urgent in what it does. And, and I see, when I look at the first century disciples, they lived in the expectation of Christ's imminent return. That's right. And of course, they never saw it. And we haven't seen it 20 years later. But I think if we're to exercise the same faith that they did, then we have to have their same uh, expectancy of Christ's imminent return and, and live in that reality. So I think that the timing is up to the Lord. It's Jesus who, it's the lamb who pulls off the seals, isn't it, in the book <laughs> of Revelation. So he determines the speed and he could speed things up and slow them down. Um, you know, according to his purposes. And uh, we shouldn't be surprised by anything that happens because he told us all these things will happen. But, but the key question is how we're going to use the time that he's given us now with the skills and gifts he's given us in the place he's put us and to be faithful doing the good works he's prepared for us every, every day. Um, you know, until uh, he takes us or until Christ returns whichever comes sooner so um they say to prophesy is extremely difficult especially with regard to the future so i think that's that would be my approach <laughs> just we live in expectation of his imminent return we let that shape our priorities but we don't get too drawn into dates and times and, and so on so uh, peter i've just uh, tomorrow one of my book goes into print about, about house church you greet the church in your house in the last page, <laughs> the last page has a summary of the end times <laughs> in two pages. 